Welcome to Frost & Sullivan's Growth, Innovation, and Leadership Briefing. Today's event is titled, Digital Transformation of the Automotive Retail Industry. What you need to know now. I would now like to hand the presentation over to Dr. Julia Saini. Thank you very much, Anna. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julia Sainim. I am Associate Partner at Frost & Sullivan, leading our After Sales and Retail Program area. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our briefing today and to provide you with a global overview on how we at Frost & Sullivan see digitalization transforming the automotive retail industry. And without further ado, I will pass on to Yeshuan, who is my co-host today. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, and a very good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of our listeners, depending on whereabouts you are dialing in from. My name is Yashwant Abhimanyu, and uh, I'm a principal consultant with Frost & Sullivan's automotive and mobility team, focusing on digital and the future of automotive retail. I work out of our offices in London, and my core areas of focus are on the topics uh, including new business models, um, automotive retail strategies, customer journeys and digital UX, digital KPIs, network planning and dealership strategies, and of course, new retail formats. Um, I'd like to, of course, uh, thank you all for having taken the time to attend our briefing today. Uh, and we at Trust & Sullivan, of course, truly hope that you find this session informative and insightful. So thank you again, and uh, back to you, Julia. Perfect. Thanks, Yeshwan. So we at Frost & Sullivan have been doing a lot of work around digital transformation in the automotive industry and with a special focus on how retailing is moving from being a transactional model towards an experience-based approach. And below are the key areas of transformation we will be discussing today. So from how retail formats are changing to how connected retailing has become a basic expectation, creating new business models, and of course, how success is measured in this new digital world. And throughout the presentation today, we will always introduce you to each of these trends, first from a non-automotive perspective, from a normal consumer perspective, and then we'll move on to how this has translated or will be translating into our automotive retail reality. But before diving into these themes, I would just like to briefly run a poll to capture your views. So, Anna, over to you on the poll. Thank you, Yulia. Yes, I have pushed out our poll question. So, if everyone can just take a second to select an answer, and we will reveal the poll results immediately. So, the poll question is, what will impact the future of automotive retailing the most? Is it new store formats, pure online retailing, omni-channel retailing, targeted and personalized promotions, or financial services? So again, we'll give everyone a, a, few, uh, a few minutes to select their answer and reveal those results immediately. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm starting to see some of the results. So, um... Okay, so these are the results that we have here. So based on, on the results, um, what we have is we show that 8% indicate new store formats, 25% indicate the pure online retailing, 41% is omni-channel retailing, followed by 8% of the targeted and personalized promotions. And lastly, 16% indicate financial services. So any any comments on that? Yeah, Anna, it's actually interesting because I would have said that at least until a few years ago, the the pure online retailing as as the most impactful trend has been seen like more of a of a metropolitan myth. So it's actually really interesting that the industry starts believing that there is a channel, a complementary channel to the channels as we know it coming in. And of course, omni channel retailing. So we're connected on the go the whole time, the bricks and the clicks. And um, it's good that we'll be spending some of time 
on these themes today and then hopefully based on the feedback that Yeshwan and I will have to provide we can maybe um, take some questions and come come back to to this first poll that we had. So um, coming to yes, the retail formats in the automotive industry and the non-automotive industry, what we've seen over the years, retail stores overall have become smaller. They've become ephemeral with a strong urban focus. So moving from these big outlets, the bigger the better, to more and more centrally located outlets. Yes, of course, we'll still have the big Sainsbury's, the Tesco's, the Metro Market in suburban areas. But at the same time, we are more and more seeing smaller urban and easily accessible formats and versions of these same outlets. They're in the proximity of our offices in urban residential areas and mostly within walking distance of urban population. And we've seen a similar evolution in the automotive industry. So yes, conventional channels will still sell the majority of vehicles by 2025, 2030, and it's really not all black and white. But we really have seen the proliferation of channels that coexist and that are still radically changing the dealership landscape as we know it. So we have the fully flat digital flagship stores like the Audi City Berlin that is shown here, where instead of having a display of 15 to 20 vehicles, massive inventory, we might just see two or three models. And with the rest of the entire range that's still accessible via digital technology, still able to display an unlimited number of models and configurations. Then we have the lifestyle stores like the Renault Atelier in Paris or the Lexus Intersect in Tokyo, inviting people to subtly experience the brand in a social setting over a coffee or a drink or in an ambience restaurant, so basically in a place for social gatherings. Then we have the pop-up stores that are really the most ephemeral of formats. They're here one day, gone the next, but always focused on these high foodful areas centered around special events like you could think of sport tournaments, a concert, or a special time of the year. And the one displayed here was, um, was launched in December 2018 by Mercedes-Benz. And they opened for one day a pop-up shop dealership inside a mall in Pennsylvania. But instead of seeing the actual cars in the pop-up stores as we know them, for one day, um, Mercedes dedicated the whole day for little ones to get the full dealership experience. So actually children had the chance to test drive an assortment of models, no license required. Each received an owner's manual and their own little driver's license with a photo on it. And if any of the kids fell in love with the car, they were able to purchase it online, which is online, which is um, rather neat. And this actually brings me to, to the next important channel, and we've seen it also in, in the poll, it's online retailing. So digitization is reshaping the way we buy and the way we service vehicles. At Frost & Salon, we've done a lot of work around the new channels, and we expect revenues generated by online vehicle retail after sales and service to grow from about 120 billion today to about 605 billion by 2025. 95% of revenue generated worldwide will come from Europe, America and China, and half of which generated by retail of new vehicles. By 2025, China is expected to lead, followed by Europe. Whereas the online news vehicle market online is expected to triple by 2025, with Europe being the biggest market. When we look at worldwide after sales revenues, these are expected to grow from about 29 billion to 78 billion by 2025, and growth is driven primarily by increased online sales of parts and accessories and innovative servicing business models, the so-called aggregators. 
We've done a detailed study on it. We call it the Uberization of Vehicle Services that looks at the potential of these service aggregators. And we've seen several of these service aggregators coming into the space over the past few years. We have Outer Butler, Karubi, Who Can Fix My Car, um, Fair Garage. And some of these platforms offer simply a broker service. They are mediators between service partners, and online customers, and they rely on an established and certified network of garages for the customers to choose from. And others, such as Karubi, for example, follow an e-servicing model where the company takes full responsibility of the entire service contract, selecting both the garage that is expected to do the job, but also procuring directly the parts that are actually and potentially required by the garage itself. And why is this so interesting? Well, we all know garages really need their base to be utilized at 80 to 90%. Only then they will start making money. And this is what all of these models have in common. However, garages that are attached to digital network increase their business performance significantly as compared to those that are purely operating offline. Coming to our second trend, omnichannel retailing. So over the decades, we moved from a pure bricks channel where we had the department store, the supermarkets, the hypermarkets, to the pure clicks channel. But what we're really seeing now, and as you can see some of the these channels, that create the so-called bricks and clicks retail. And what is the impact to it for the automotive industry? Consumers expect to seamlessly move from the online world into the physical world and back again. Both customer acquisition and retention will require OEMs, dealers, garages to engage digitally with the customers along the entire life cycle, focusing on the customer experience and the customer centricity. And this focus still remains and it will be for a while on creating this seamless online offline customer journey with even greater levels of engagement and the importance of digital assets as we'll see later in the presentation will be a key parameter for digitization investment decisions amongst the OEMs. Manufacturers constantly create solutions that aim at engaging the consumer with the brand and increasing, increasing this brand loyalty. So Tesla, for example, creates new user experiences and these delight factors simply via software updates. The car itself changes with its user and engages way beyond the loved, loved first sight moment that we all have when we get a car. Other manufacturers engage with offer upgrades on financing packages um, and, and, and its vehicles via a simple click of an app. And then, of course, we have the unlimited options that come with the use cases created by the connected vehicle. In the UK, we have the example, and it's, it's an interesting case study, of a dealership group that really transformed the way vehicles are bought, and it's called Rocker. So commencing with Hyundai as a brand in 2015, Rocker is now the digital storefront of three major brands, Jella, Ford, and Mitsubishi. And the concept they used is rather simple. Stores are located in high fruitful areas like shopping malls or even stores within the stores. Like Ford Rocker has its store within the store of the fashion retailer Next. And the concept allows people to really easily just stroll into a dealership and browse. People who would never have walked into a conventional store, and, and, and believe me, some dealerships are seriously intimidating, just walk in whilst they do the shopping. And all of this is aided by product angels, like we know them from the Apple stores. They're hired specifically from brands like Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, Apple itself. And these product angels are simply there to support the customer experience with the car and the brand. And they are not paid commission for sales because if a customer decides to purchase the vehicle, this can only be done online even from within the store. So again, omnichannel retailing and connecting the bricks and the clicks and really showing that the customer 
experience is not linear anymore. Which brings me to the next trend, um, connected retailing. So you and me, all of us, we're constantly connected via two or three devices. I've got my iPhone here, I've got my laptop here, I've got my Blackberry here, and we are connected, we purchase and consume on the go. And whilst until a couple of years ago, we basically would purchase via the traditional e-commerce commerce funnels as we know them, like the website or the online marketplaces, the next generation of consumers are directly using social media channels such as WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram to buy the goods. They buy, they share the purchase, and they connect on the go. And one example of, uh, of the, from the non-automotive world is Fred, for example. So Fred created this personal shopping service, and the primary target are wealthy millennials. Now, on trend number four, ladies and gentlemen, on, on retail technologies, now customers are increasingly demanding technologies that make the shopping experience seamless and, of course, more convenient. Now, with the advent of new forms of retail, in addition to consumers being interested in receiving personal attention from staff, they are also prioritizing a very personalized digital experience. Now, be it... Uh, the likes of your magic mirror, which assists a fashion shopper, or uh, a gamified experience engaging a teenager, or even, um, you know, visiting uh, a Amazon Go store with seamless checkouts and with zero wait lines. Um, a number of innovative engaging retailing technologies have surfaced in the last few years. Now, we are also uh, witnessing, um, you know, a number of innovations in, in some of the other industries. We recently saw, uh, you know, British Airways' digital billboards in Chiswick, very close to our um, Frost & Sullivan offices in London, actually, um, and in Piccadilly that, in, that interacted seamlessly with British Airways aircraft in the sky, thanks to custom-built surveillance technology that tracked the aircraft and interrupted the billboard display just as it passed over the sites. Again, Extremely unique, a very, very unique approach of engaging with customers itself. Now, the use of technologies such as AR, uh, VR, biometrics such as voice, touch, gestures, um, 3D configurators, holographic projections, um, all of these really are making a very, very big change uh, within um, you know, the future of automotive uh, and general retailing itself. Now, interactivity, engagement, and store experience into something that is truly unique an experience that is unparalleled, helping to attract uh, people back into the brick and mortar retail stores itself. Um, now, running analytics to better understand customers beyond uh, is another added advantage and another added use case of uh, retailing technologies itself. A similar application is seen, of course, in uh, physical locations and uh, online store locations of automotive companies as well. And as, of course, we move on to my next slide over here, we can see that a number of, uh, you know, the industry participants and stakeholders, including the OEMs, are disrupting the market with personalized solutions, really creating opportunities for win-win partnerships. Now, digital in-store tools in combination with the use of smartphones and, of course, Internet research can offer a seamless automotive retail experience along omni-channel touch points. Now, let's take, for example, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, a retail journey that starts on an online interface, which then, of course, continues uh, to the retail experience in the store. A number of retail technologies today along this specific journey are changing the way that retail processes um, as we know it itself and that and the way that retail processes work for example websites with interactive features uh, assist in better communicating the brand and the product value proposition thus better engaging the customer in the search phase itself now pilots such as fiat live store a few years ago in brazil um, is a is an exemplary example um, of you know this technological innovation where customers could be in front of their computers and could be digitally beamed into a space where Fiat vehicles could be showcased and presented in real time. Uh, 
This was done by Fiat experts and hosts using a proprietary headset with high resolution micro cameras, uh, a microphone, uh, headphones, and of course, a streaming device as well. Very, very unique in its approach. Um, in addition, technology solutions such as your online financial simulators can help customers better understand the various financing offers uh, that are possible and also aid in vehicle related finance spending and planning. The in-store tools um, are synced to the online customer experience itself, really ensuring a very smooth transition between online to offline and back online as well, if necessary. Now, all of this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is really uh, helping in reducing time and lengthy operational processes sometimes when it comes to buying uh, a vehicle itself. The role of retail technologies at Frost & Sullivan, as we understand it, is really threefold. One, to aid the customer in better understanding the brand, its vehicles, the features, um, and really thus creating a, a new, connected, uh, immersive, and more personalized experience that is, that is unlimited. Number two, to also support in upselling to the customers by focusing on the experience itself. And number three, and more importantly, leveraging the big data that is created through using these technologies um, to conduct store analytics, for example, to, to better understand your, your customer behavior, um, to, to offer personalized marketing, and to also aid in aspects such as you know, lead management, CRM, new product development, and the likes. Now, examples, uh, pilots, um, and of course, even uh, showcases as shown on the slide um, include the likes of your Toyota, includes the likes of BMW, Ford in China, and Audi really experimenting and leveraging retail technologies to its fullest. Toyota, for example, recently launched an AR application to provide a view inside their um, CHR hybrid model um, using augmented reality technology and object recognition software. Similarly, BMW's project with, uh, with Zero Light and a few other partners through its BMW M virtual experience enables potential customers to configure, to explore, and to actually even sit inside their digital vehicle on a one-to-one -one scale. Now, this ability to offer that immersive experience is really at the heart of innovations when it comes to retail technologies. Um, of course, in addition, through customer IDs, Engaging with the customer to offer more personalized and customized offering is also key, really creating that link between omni-channel online and offline as, as we were speaking. Now, considering Frost & Sullivan's uh, estimates that over 1 million vehicles by 2020, 2021 uh, in that time frame will be retailed through online mediums by OEMs, dealership, and other marketplaces and aggregators, um, the leveraging of these digital retail technologies across both online as well as offline is already gaining a lot of impetus. Already today, um, you know, participants such as Tesla in a number of different global markets, Renault or PSA in Brazil, a host of different participants in Europe, the likes of JLR, Ford, um, Hyundai, BMW, CarWow, Dacia, Volvo, uh, Opel, um, you know, the likes of Mahindra, Tata and Hyundai in India, uh, Alibaba, BYD, Buick in China. All of these companies are really innovating around the online and offline and the digital technology revolution itself as we are seeing it. I'll move on to my next trend, trend number five. Uh, which is that of new business models in vehicle retail, specifically focused on disruption in the ownership and usership models. Now, when we look at the traditional vehicle retailing formats, nothing major has really changed for a very, very long period of time, right? From car sharing to whether outrightly purchasing the vehicle, we've all been very used to the same methods of vehicle retailing formats itself. Um, we have noticed, however, that in the last few years, there's been a rise in uh, leasing within the, re within the retail market itself, which has really signaled already a shift uh, about uh, one of the aspects that we, we speak about a lot nowadays, which is the shift away from ownership towards more usership itself. Now, people today really want flexibility. They want more and more to drive the car when they need it and not necessarily be bound to a long-term contract. The gap, therefore, um, as you can see on the slide, between short-term rentals and leasing was identified by market players as an opportunity to develop and, of course, offer a number of flexible services. Um, 
And as such, um, that was the birth of what uh, we call vehicle subscriptions today. And therefore, vehicle subscriptions uh, have emerged over the last uh, over the last year, year and a half or so. These subscription models have really, um, you know, changed the way by offering opportunities to offer more flexibility and, of course, uh, by by being able to uh, to be coupled with a number of different value added services itself. Now, in terms of uh, players who are currently active in the vehicle subscription, uh, um, you know, market here in Europe, for example, on the OEM side, you have the likes of Volvo with uh, with the Care by Volvo program uh, present in almost seven countries. You have JLR with their uh, Carpet Drive program in the UK. There is Cadillac uh, with its program in Germany. And apart from the OEMs, there are also third party providers and startups such as Drover or, or Wagonex or, or Cluno um, in the European region really playing a role in this particular space. Now, OEM offerings generally, when we speak about vehicle subscriptions, range anywhere between 500 euros a month all the way up to about 1,300 euros a month for a new vehicle uh, with a fixed uh, minimum contract period. Uh, but there are a few other OEMs like, like Cadillac, for example, who have taken a slightly different approach uh, by offering their their service uh, being focused on a membership type of business model, therefore granting access to all Cadillac and Chevrolet performance models for a period of either one, three, or six months for a monthly subscription price itself. Of course, there are a few other players as well in the market who offer next to new or almost or slightly you know, used type of vehicles for a contract period of a minimum of one month uh, up to a maximum of 24 months and are capable of offering these packages starting from um, really competitive prices of as low as 350 euros, depending, of course, on the choices of the consumer. Now, it is important to notice that uh, there is a real correlation uh, in the level of the pricing with the age of the vehicle, with the contract period, the mileage per vehicle uh, per year, and, of course, even the number of vehicle swaps that, uh, that a user wants to use during the period itself. Now, the emergence, ladies and gentlemen, of this new business model, at least for the time being, allows new entrants to be very creative, uh, to really bring about innovation in the service itself, uh, innovation in how it's packaged, innovation in how it's offered. Um, and this only means that um, there is not only room to grow, but also room to improve on the go while, you know, we, we understand customer segments and their needs uh, better as we go through the process itself. On my next slide, um, I have an example, and this is just an exhibit, uh, really an illustration of how diverse the vehicle subscription universe really is. Um, it allows for OEM and tech company partnerships. Uh, it allows for partnerships between OEMs and dealerships, OEMs, dealers, along with uh, you know platform provider companies, and many, many more. Now, platform providers, if you see, are at the very base of this pyramid over here um, and are really creating their own programs as well as sharing their platforms with dealer groups with OEMs in order to create something that is extremely unique uh, in the way that it's offered itself. Therefore, um, you know, for any new market entrant, um, regardless of the region, we at Frost & Sullivan believe that um, it is extremely useful uh, and also important to consider potential partnerships in order to shorten, um, you know, the go-to-market time and, of course, innovate with the service and the offering itself. Even if, of course, for the time being in Europe, we are witnessing only growing development so far, we are aware of many players currently who are, who are you know, assessing the service and how they can actually go to market with vehicle subscription services itself. And this primarily translates into our forecast that by 2025, all major OEMs, we believe, will offer a vehicle subscription type service with a mix of both new and used vehicles, you know, along with different body uh, body styles, uh, with different vehicle classes and so on. And we also do believe that by 2025, uh, there will be a number of non-automotive or non-OEM companies who will enter the vehicle subscription market itself. According to our studies, of course, um, we do believe that the market uh, in Europe, at least, has the potential to reach approximately 9 million vehicles in operation by 2025 um, under vehicle subscriptions and about 7 million vehicles in operations in the U.S. by 2025 uh, as well. 
on to my next slide uh, ladies and gentlemen it's a it's a small little example like we we've, we've been talking you know today's consumer really wants mobility um and uh, geely uh, the owners of volvo of course have chosen to tackle the usership paradigm through its new global brand uh, link and co by offering two big innovations a subscription based buying model and of course a, a, a car sharing function um as well Now under the subscription service users pay a monthly fee for the use of the car similar to you know some of the popular subscription models that we that we all I'm sure use today like Netflix or Spotify um and in China this monthly fee actually includes free wifi it includes uh, insurance servicing costs and of course breakdown cover as well in addition you know using a smartphone application um and you know the use of a button which says uh, share my car um you know the user can actually allow other to access and drive the car as well for a set period of time again which is extremely interesting and um you know really pushing towards you know that trend that we're talking about which is new business models within uh, vehicle retailing itself on to uh, my final trend before i pass it back on to julia for for, for trend number 3 um which is that of uh, the emergence of what we at trust and sullivan call digital kpis now with the increased influence of digital within the automotive markets um, you know the way of assessing our business performance and the success we believe really really needs to change um we do um, believe that you know existing old kpis are not necessarily conclusive enough anymore to measure newer success business as usual as we all know it is changing and we need these newer digital kpis that are aligned to the business transformation that that you know each of our uh, enterprises and organizations are actually going through therefore we at frost and sullivan define digital kpis as digital matrices uh, to evaluate businesses and employees on digital initiatives and quantify also the benefits of the process that they are responsible for with the aim of monitoring the outcome of the digital investment that has been made itself now we have identified that there are two types of digital kpi categories uh, that need to be embraced uh, a type 1 category that focuses on digitizing a current enterprise that is for example you know the inclusion of a digital technology or a solution to a current analog process say for example uh, the inclusion of 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 um, you know interactive tablets within uh, a, a dealership environment that could be an example of of a type 1 uh, a type 2 of course is a completely new kpi for digital uh, new new digital businesses and digital functions itself so say for example as a business i want to go online uh, i want to start with digital retailing or i want to start with uh, an e marketplace for example so to assess these kinds of newer business models that are completely digitally focused we need a different type of kpi which is a type 2 kpi as we define it we do believe that these digital kpis will influence the entire automotive and transportation landscape starting all the way from supply chain to manufacturing to the product down to uh, the downstream of the industry you know towards retail towards aftermarket and and services itself and we also very firmly believe from the research that we have done that increasingly these digital kpis will be extremely customer centric in how um they manifest themselves uh itself so just for an example of course in the retail front you know digital kpis can of course help dealerships um you know remain competitive by developing um, newer channels to attract leads to monitor inventory or even assessing um employees making digital kpi alignment central to boost the complete dealership's profitability itself now some of the kpis as we know today some of the older kpis like number of store walk-ins or the number of walk-ins to um, test drive ratio or even to an extent some of the operating kpis we believe will start to take a, a back seat while some of the newer kpis such as you know the percentage of upselling via a digital configurator or the percentage of training delivered online or online response time um customer engagement engagement scores uh, kpis like the click to buy ratio um all of these we believe will start to take more center stage as we go on the digital journey uh, of of retail and how that influences um you know the online and offline paradigm itself now companies such as carva really here in the uk and in the european region um really showcase some best practices um in this particular space 
Now, the ability to, of course, use these KPIs already exists today, uh, driven by a lot of the digital investments that, you know, dealerships, OEMs, uh, manufacturers, and of course, the entire automotive value chain have actually made into digital um, operations itself. Now, at the center of all of these investments, um, and at the center of these KPIs, of course, is really elevating, you know, the customer experience um, across all of the platforms, whether that is online or offline, and really building analytics to shape the future um, of each of these enterprises' business plans itself. Um, with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, that is, um, you know, the end of our trend number six, which is that of uh, digital KPIs and and how that is influencing the future of um, automotive retail. But I'll pass it back on to uh, Julia now to, of course, take us through to, um, you know, uh, trend number three before we actually finish off with some of the key conclusions and takeaways uh, for our presentation today itself. Julia, back to you. Thank you very much. And I do apologize. Um, there's always a first time for something. And yes, unfortunately, it was my first time. So I do apologize. Um, I am back on trend number three. Um, considerably important trend to, to summarize. We're really looking at how digital as a channel is graduating from being more of a marketing tool as we knew it to actually a sales channel and how outside the automotive industry, newer social channels are becoming, um, are substituting e-commerce as as we know it from, uh, from the platform. So we have threads coming in with personal shoppers pushing behind on WhatsApp to Burberry who has just launched something similar now beginning of September. And um, when we look at the automotive industry, uh, an example that really brings this connected retailing to life comes from China, from Tmall. So Tmall, very similar, as we all know, to Amazon. So Tmall, um, yeah, where uh, it, uh, the offerings are targeted to high spenders. And these high spenders are very well looked after, their profile is created. And uh, Tmall has partnered with Maserati to engage this specific club of VIPs. They have created video games where the VIP race and Maserati against each other. They redeem points. They, um, they can win either a test drive in a Maserati store or they're invited to a special cocktail drink. So racing and engaging against each other all on this Tmall platform. So when these VIPs from Tmall actually go into the store to redeem their points or to have a test drive through the facial recognition, and it's not cyber science, facial recognition we have it on our app phone, the store actually recognizes the profile that we have, that the user has on Tmall. And the store knows and the store associate knows what type of car this um, this high spender has been looking at, the type of configuration he or she has been doing, the type of holiday, what cars they have been racing, and guide him already towards a certain spec. The, um, there's the possibility to explain explore the vehicle, again, via the Tmall app, so the customer can hold it against the car and get um, more details about either this engine, their interiors, where they were made, how it was customized. They can have in-store virtual reality test drives, and at the, day, at the end of the day, when they're happy and they see their little shopping bag on Tmall, like we see our books on Amazon, um, do you want to buy the car? All they do is to flick. Their credit card is already on the platform, and here they go home with a nice Maserati. Again, maybe not for everybody's taste, but to give you an idea how how this online, offline, this new customer journey, and this constantly being connected on an Amazon, on a Tmall, on an Alibaba, actually enticed to new purchasing behaviors. So I will move back now to our conclusion slide, really just summarizing our journey today. And I'm really keen on leaving some time for 
us to have an open discussion for Yeshwan and I to engage with you. So please start putting through your questions. And again, to summarize, really, we will have a lot of channels and they will live in parallel. So it's not the death of the dealership as we know it, but there will be refinements. The dealership might look differently. It might use a different engagement methods, just as Yeshwan has shown different technologies. But what is the reality is really that the revenues that are generated from digital automotive retailing are going to go from 120 billion to 605 billion by 2025 and we've done studies about it and whoever would like to contact me to discuss these um, numbers uh, more than happy to do so and one of the points that maybe I, I haven't spent so much time on the, today is that really this whole digital digitization story is a business enabler. Digital allows um, companies to accelerate data analytics, to create new revenue models, but really to allow for personalization of the user experience and the relevance of services. Everybody collects data, but if I get offered services that are relevant to my behavior, to what I need, I might mind less. So with that, um, I pass on to Anna and, um, and then hopefully two questions. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Yaswant. So at this time, I'd like to just go over quickly some next steps and then we'll go straight away into our, our questions here. So if you would like to um, get more information about scheduling our growth strategy dialogue, it's a complimentary open discussion with one of our Frost and Sullivan growth strategy consultants and a tenured analyst. Please reach out to us. Our contact information is listed on the screen. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and start our questions. So our first question here reads, how will test drives be handled? Okay, so I'm just going to start taking this and then probably just pick Yeshwan's brain as well. Um, you know, what I... What we what we're looking at is um, is is changing the layout of the dealership, so changing the front end office and the back end office. So the online model actually is really conducive to booking test drives and having the vehicle brought by a sales associate or by a um, uh, by a collaborator of a dealership or an OEM directly to the place, I want to have this test drive. So, for example, a Tesla is bought online. You go online, you do call your configuration, and you book your test drive. And guess what? The sales associate comes to your home, lets you drive the Tesla, accompanied or um, unaccompanied in certain circumstances around the area you will be driving it. So, for me, a test drive in a dealership in an area that maybe I won't even use a vehicle then for is far less um, entrusting than having the vehicle board to either my workplace to try the commute that I do or at my home to try it out, I don't know, with the kids in the back. So I think the online model is actually a great tool for test drives. And I'm not sure, Yefren, did you actually talk about this um, this model um, with a test drive that it's like the self-service test driving model that they are um, experiencing? Um, I actually, um, on, on this particular question, Julia, I completely agree with your points. I think with the, you know, when we speak about the online uh, retail journey itself or the online customer journey, you know, there are many different aspects. There are aspects of trade-ins, there are aspects of research. Um, Really, with the online model, we are seeing examples, especially in Europe, you know, where uh, some of the OEMs are offering almost every step of this customer journey to be able to, um, you know, be handled online itself. Now, with relation to test drives, I think what is really interesting is this is where online and offline and, you know, that really omni-channel uh, bouncing off of, of different touch points 
really will start to play a key role. Um, going back to the point uh, that you were mentioning, Julia, that it's extremely important for us to understand that while online is definitely something that is growing, is definitely influencing the market as we know it, um, it is core as to how online is really complementing the offline journey itself. Um, and, you know, um, even uh, test drives is one of those examples, uh, you know, one of those steps within the within the customer journey where online is complementing that along with an offline step, um, you know, like, say, for example, a, a, a dealer coming to uh, our homes to showcase the car or, you know, um, maybe a, a customer going to a dealership just for the test drive and then going back to the online uh, customer journey. Um, similarly, you know, with vehicle trade-ins also, we have seen um, you know, there is the step online, for example, wherein you can, um, you know, put in the car that you want to trade in, but uh, the actual okay to trade in that car is really done uh, after the inspection at a dealership today. And that's how the online journey as such, um, you know, is is complementing the offline journey. Uh, and I think that's where, that's the beauty of, you know, how online is really um uh, enabling or, 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 you know, strengthening, uh, you know, the dealership and the automotive retail model as we know it itself. Okay, perfect. And um, sorry, over over to you, Anna. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. So our next question here from our audience. Hello, good presentation. I think the market is diverging into even a wider new segment, such as city dwellers who never buy a car, to those in rural areas who need a long-term owned vehicle, and some in between who rent monthly with low tenured periods. Where do you think or guess the most profitable, profitable excuse me, sectors will be? And I love the, 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 the guesswork here. <laughs> so, uh, no, thanks. It's a really, really good question because, um, yes, we definitely have a one size does not fit all. So when we all talk about shared mobility, car sharing, ride hailing, we're really talking about urban areas. It often does not work if we live somewhere in suburban areas or if we're actually just passing through um, to a country. So uh, Yeshwan has touched upon it earlier. And I'm not necessarily sure whether we look at the most profitable business model there, but I think it is actually a business model that is very, very interesting and that might be able to answer a lot of these challenging with the solution of the subscription services. So subscription services are actually a micro-mobility solution that sits in between uh, the rental and, and leasing a vehicle. And, um, and it takes care of, of the whole servicing business for the user. And actually then at the end of, of the need period, just changing a car or transferring back on, on shorter lease terms. So, yes, and what are your thoughts about it? Um, obviously, the profitability is a bit of a sensitive question around the subscription service. There's been a lot of discussions around it. But how do you see it as a, um, as a good solution, as a new business model? I, I completely agree with you, Julia. I think I think as 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 a new business model solution, it's extremely innovative and it's really you know um, uh, slotting itself in that position between um, you know short term rentals and of course uh, 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 leasing um, as such. Um, really, primarily you know um, offering a number of different. Um, you know, uh, services and value added features along with the subscription itself. I think, you know, uh, as I was mentioning during my presentation as well, you know, people today really want that flexibility, especially when they're living in urban centers. Um, uh, you know, the use of the vehicle itself uh, for different, uh, you know, for, for their daily commute is slightly different from how they may want to use uh, a vehicle for, for their weekends and the type of vehicle also therefore changes. So I think, you know, people want that flexibility today. Um, they want more and more, of course, uh, you know, to drive a car when they need it and not necessarily be bound to a to a long term contract as such. And I think that's where, you know, vehicle subscriptions with the flexibility that it offers with the um, with the uh, value added services, whether that's in terms of, uh, you know, uh, maintenance and so on and so forth that are included within the offering or the package itself really, really uh, as a business model, really sets it apart. Um, 
And, um, you know, even within, um, you know, subscription models um, as such, Julia, of course, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, some of the OEMs taking a direction of where they will offer a new car for a fixed, uh, you know, contract for a fixed uh, uh, period, uh, contract period, say a couple of, uh, a couple of years. Um, but then there are uh, the likes of, say, Cadillac, for example, like I was mentioning, who are also offering, uh, you know, for a one, three or a six month period and is a more uh, subscription based, um, you know, model as such. So um, again, going back to the point that we were we were discussing even during the presentation, that the subscription uh, service um, uh, market as such being um, rather nascent um, um, today, and it's really you know grown a lot over the last um, you know year year and a half. There is a lot of scope for a lot more innovation, for a lot more um, for a lot more uh, out of the box thinking when it actually comes to how can we position the service, how can we restructure the service to really be. Uh, in line with the changing needs of many different dynamic customer personas. Um, so I think from a business model perspective, uh, it really offers uh, some very, very exciting, uh, um, you know, potential and, and uh, um, you know, um, innovations going forward itself. Thank you, Yaswan. Thank you, Julia. So I see that uh, we're just about out of time. So what we're going to do is conclude the session. Now, those questions that we did not get to address today, the team will get back with you uh, via email or telephone. What I have done is I have posted the contact details for um, Julia and Yeswant. Should you have any additional feedback or you want to schedule uh, with them, and we want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Shana. Thank you, ladies and